Yeah, thanks, Benoit. Uh, let's go live now, shall we, to uh, Laura Smith, our correspondent there at Knightsbridge outside the uh, Ecuadorian embassy. Hi. It's a big wait at the moment, isn't it, Laura? A big uh, countdown. What time is it now in London? Just about 25 minutes to 11 in the morning. So about uh, an hour and 25 minutes to go. But, of course, it's unlikely that he's going to walk now, as he said he would, because the UN panel found it in his favour, of course. That's right. It's interesting what your guest just said there about uh, the likelihood of him being formally arrested if he does walk out, because the development that we've seen in the last half hour or so is that, remember earlier I said there was a, hardly any police presence here. There was a, a sort of a, a flyby by a couple of police helicopters, uh, not helicopters, uh, motorcycles who slowed down as they passed by the door. Uh, that was the only police presence that we've seen this morning. But then just about half an hour ago, this van pulled up outside the door. So while they might have been keeping uh, the police watch sort of on the lowdown. Uh, they're now parked right outside the door. Um, so if ever there was a signal that should Assange choose to walk out of the doors, he'll be arrested. That's it. You can see it right behind me. Um, but as far as what will happen, we are, as you say, expecting this media conference to happen at midday. We understand that Assange will be broadcasting uh, by video link into that uh, media conference, which will take place down the road in the front line club. Um, as to what he will say, you know, this has been a massive coup for him and his legal team. Uh, they now have kind of moral grounds to fight on. Um, but I think that his expectation of getting his passport back and being free to go is, mm. is, is not going to happen today. Uh, don't listen to me, though. I'm joined by Gavin McFadden, who is the director of the Centre for Investigative Journalism. Gavin, thanks for coming down. Now, Pleasure. you are, uh, you expect I think one of many of his supporters who will come down both here and the Frontline Club. Why is it important to you to be here? Well, I think the, the victory for free speech and for attack, uh, an absence of attacks on publishers like Julian Assange is very important. It means a great deal to anybody who cares about an independent alternative press in this country where uh, somebody like him can be subject to the kind of uh, cruelty that he's been subjected to without any kind of real opposition. But this is the first time that he's had the moral support for it. So and Were you surprised it. by this decision? Is this what you were expecting? I mean, it, it, it seems to be a bit of a departure for the UN. I think, no, it's happened in the past. But this is, don't forget, a case which is uh, very well known to people around the world and not so well known in Britain, oddly enough. And the press here has been uniformly hostile to Assange, almost exclusively so. Uh, and the result is that people here have no idea that most people in the world have a rather different take on the Assange situation than, than they do here. Um, the UK uh, authorities and yesterday the Swedish authorities said that this decision changes nothing. Um, does it change something for you? Oh, I think it does, and it changes a lot for them as well. I mean, don't forget, they spent 16 months uh, with collecting material and evidence on this case from both governments, and uh, it's very difficult for them to claim it doesn't mean anything now and they're not bound by it in any way, which is what they're saying. And how do you see that? How do you see this effect? And there must have been difficult conversations in Whitehall uh, about whether uh, the UK and Sweden can, can maintain their moral authority if they choose to ignore a UN decision like this? Well, they are ignoring it for the moment. I think that'll change. Do you? Oh, yeah. I think that uh, this is the public position has to show strength. They have to show that they're not going to be determined by a bunch of foreigners. I mean, there's a lot of that sort of sentiment in the government. So uh, in that sense, it's quite logical they'd say that. I think from a political point of view, however, you're, you're right in suggesting that the moral undercoating has been, has been uh, struck away from this case. They, they have very little moral precedent here. I mean, particularly as they supported this very same group, the same commission, the UN, in lots of cases in the past, when it's been to their advantage. When suddenly it's not to their advantage, they say, oh, you know, nothing to do with us. But so do you expect a gradual sort of backing down by the government? I think that they'll look for opportunities. That's what I would suspect. But again, you know, they, the, we, it's very hard to generate knowledge about what their political uh, interests are when they're so diverse as this is. And what the Americans are doing, I mean, the, the clear position here is that the Americans are keeping the pressure up to make sure that the Brits and the Swedes keep him inside as long as they possibly can. So, but that nobody discusses that because that's the great elephant in the living room and nobody wants to talk about it. Um, so we're waiting now for Assange to make this statement, the first he's made for some time. What do you expect him to say? Oh, well, I think he's, he'll be talking about the moral victory this represents. I think that his, his legal team and all the people around him have been uh, pressing for this for a long time. We've always been surprised that it hasn't happened as with the rapidity we would have hoped. But it's certainly happening now. 
and though it's, it's making the British and the Swedish governments very uncomfortable. And I think that's an index of how important it is. I just want to ask you one more question briefly. You are an investigative journalist yourself, yeah. and you have been working with whistleblowers for a long time and mm -hmm. representing them essentially. Does this, what is seen as some by the persecution of Assange, does that, uh, is that a sign that's sent to the whistleblowing and investigative journalistic community? Well, it means that uh, nobody can dispute that there's a moral high ground here and that he's on that high ground as many whistleblowers are, as most whistleblowers are. And, that, and that's uh, about time that we've heard that publicly. It's not in the interest of governments to support whistleblowers. I mean, there's an old saying, if, if the government denies it, you know, you know it's true. So and I think in this case, it's also true here that they don't like whistleblowers, but, and they certainly don't like Julian Assange. But look what's happened. Have you feared for your work and the work of your colleagues since this saga began five years ago? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's been an inspiration to a lot of people, you know, who, who said uh, they, were, they didn't know there was any point in standing up. If you had documents, you had evidence, you had serious factual material, uh, you were frightened to do anything about it. He's shown that you can get away with it. You can actually stand up. And I think it's very important. All right, Gavin McFadden, thank you very much. And thank you for waiting for such a long time. We appreciate it. Uh, that's Gavin McFadden there from the Centre for Investigative Journalism. Uh, I'll be here all day. Uh, the press conference, as I say, we're expecting mm -hmm. at midday, so in just an hour and a half. Uh, do stay with us. Yeah, OK, Laura, thanks for that. So lots more to come for you a little bit later. Hi there, if you just joined us.